it all began. Let's take it back because I think so what story. makes well, what makes it all the more impressive is, is that you know you did not come from a background which which made it easy for you uh, financially. Your father famously took on all these jobs to make it possible for you. You, you know, you came really from the bottom to work your way up. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been racing a long time. I've been racing for 23 years, which is, uh, you know... Because you started when you were eight. I started when I was eight, yeah. And um, basically it was a, a... My parents separated when I was two, and my, I spent weekends with my dad, and he had no idea what to do with me. He's not particularly comfortable with kids, and he had no, he's like, you know, what do I do with this kid um, on the weekends? And... We would watch the Grand Prix, so I started watching Grand Prix from, I think, five, fascinated with cars, and he bought me um, a, a radio control car. And then it just so happened, we were living in, oh, he was living in Hatfield, and one of the, uh, the, the neighbors had uh, a professional RC car. And at five, he let, oh, I think I was four, he let me drive it. And this is quite expensive, but I was just so good at it. Um, so my dad bought me uh, one for Christmas, and uh, there was a local club up in the, in, the, in the countryside, not far from us, and I went and raced against, I was four or five years old, racing against people of, of all our age. I was, I was the youngest there by at least 10, 12 years. And I was beating all these, you know, and, and they, they were stand up on the rostrum because they're looking down over a track. And I'd had to have like two beer uh, or two, uh, you know, crates to stand up on to be able to see over the, <laughs> the you know, the, um, the wall and um, so your dad was getting the idea that you were probably pretty good at this. Yeah, because I just had such good hand-to-eye coordination, and, and the people were just they couldn't believe at the time. And I went on Blue Peter, I think, when I was five, uh, racing against adults again, and uh, which is kind of neat. And then he, I think, just he, I, I don't know if someone spoke to him about getting me a go kart, but he, I think, perhaps someone said to him, he does have such good hand-to-eye coordination. How about getting him a kart? And um, he bought me a go kart from the loot. I think from the loot newspaper. It's been owned by like five or six families. And um, we drove it around the B&Q car park and up, up and down the street uh, where we lived and um, entered into a, a, a local kart track, which is Hoddesdon, in, in, um, called Wright House. And um, yeah, we entered our first, our first six races as a novice. And I won my first six races as, as a novice. And of and such thing, dreams are made. Because yeah. obviously you then went on, you worked your way up, you know, through the different uh, sort, of, uh, sort of layers of racing, if you like, before you finally yeah. hit the heady heights of Formula One. And did you... It wasn't... The, for us, it was just a hobby, though. But was is, there a plan at some... I mean, at some point, did you think... At some stage, that, yeah, at one point... Do you think, I actually, I could, I, could, I could be doing Formula One, I could be winning Formula One? Well, already at five, I wanted to be at and Senna. After watching him, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I know it's very rare and pretty much, I don't think I know any of my friends that knew what, it, what they wanted to do at five. You know, um, it, was at, it was actually either Ed and Senna or Superman, but I'll say it couldn't be <laughs> Superman. So, um, but the crazy thing about racing is, is it's not like uh, tennis or football, uh, which are also very hard to get into, but I guess um, there's only 22 of us in Formula One. So it's, you know, it's the pinnacle of the sport. It's very hard to get there. It's very expensive. And so in my first year, I think um, my dad spent his life savings already. Him and my stepmom, they spent their life savings, which was, you know, 20,000, 20, 30,000 pounds in, you know, 1992, 93, I think it was. So after that, he, he just had to, you know, he, was, he had four jobs at one stage. He was putting up for sale signs. He was putting in vendor machines. He was doing whatever he could. And in actual fact, he was working for the British Rail, so what he ended up doing was uh, he, he quit his job because he didn't have the time to do, you know, prepare my cart and go racing and do the job. So, but they wanted him back, so they, gave, they said, look, you, uh, you know, we need you back, but you can do this time in your own time as long as you get it done. And he was able to do both. Um, so the sacrifice my dad made was just, uh, just incredible, you know, most... I think probably parents here tonight probably pushing their kids to do something. Um, and it's so easy to push them too much. Mm. And be, through, through your dream of wanting to do, you know, because my dad for sure wanted to be a racing driver. I think most guys here <laughs> he wish they could you. drive. Yeah. So, um, and then after that, it just, we just kept going. I, um, I got signed when I was 13 to McLaren. I was the youngest um, at the time to get signed to a Formula 1 team. That's the thing that keeps coming up, you know, when you look at your career, you was the youngest, yeah. the youngest and the best throughout. I mean, as you say, you know, there's only 22 of you. It's, it's an incredibly um, intense, dangerous 
madly dangerous sport. I mean, when I, when I watch you, I don't know about how you feel, but you know, you've got those, what, two hours or so on the track. The intensity of your focus must be extraordinary. I mean, how do you maintain that? I don't really know how to do it, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I think from five, I was able to focus on this radio control car. So I guess repetition, um, you know, practice. Um, we have a simulator, so I spend a little bit of time in there. But I think a lot of it's, uh, you know, what I'm able to do in the car, a lot of it's natural, but a lot of it's really homing in. The, the difficult part of, of driving a Formula 1 car is understanding the, the technology, understanding the car. We have so... Firstly, we have 1,300 people in our team to make two of those cars for the year. That's a big team. And everything's built in, pretty much everything's built in-house. Um, every year, it's brand new stuff. It's, it's just so high-tech. It's fascinating. For me to see the car coming together at the beginning of the year, it's like a newborn baby. It's, it's just, um, just mind-blowing. And then through the year, it's progressing the whole time from race to race. We've got 21 races, so every weekend, it's, it's improving a tenth or two-tenths or three-tenths of a second, which by the end of the year obviously adds up to a couple of seconds faster. Um, but there in the car is understanding how I can communicate what I'm feeling through, through my body, through my butt, to my, these engineers who are from Oxford and Harvard, and help them uh, mold the car enable, to enable me to drive it into a different, into, to take it to another place, which is quite crazy. And how do you, how do you prepare for a race? I mean, do you... The risk is, is, is off the scale for you in a moment's inattention yeah, can I be think, critical. I mean, I how do you today, get your head around that? I think, I think perhaps some people today see the danger and others perhaps just see us getting in. You know, most people I meet, they don't understand why we have to be fit. Um, I don't have to be big and bulky. Actually, I have to keep my weight quite low because me weight, uh, with the car has to be a certain weight. If I'm one kilo over, um, overweight through the, for example, a race that's 66 laps, like the last race, for example, if I was one kilo over through the 66 laps, I would lose three seconds just from being one kilo heavy. Wow. So Did you know that? That's, uh, yeah, so it's, it, yeah, one kilo is worth 0 0.03 of a second. So it's, it's just I'll remember incredible. that when yeah. I put myself on the scales <laughs> yeah, tomorrow just, morning. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole new way of thinking about it. Yeah, but, it, but mostly it's the G-force. The, the car is like, um, it's like a plane upside down, but because if we have all these wings, basically, you know, obviously a plane has lift. I always descri describe it to people. Um, you know, imagine you're driving down the road, you, down the road, and you have your window down. You put your hand out the window, it blows your hand back. And if you put your hand down, it blows your hand down. And, and all our wings are like that. So the faster we go, the more force that's generated. And I think at 200 miles an hour, we have over a ton, maybe two tons of, of downforce just from the air. And so when I turn at 200 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour, the thing goes like a rocket in whatever direction I point it in. But um, then you're on the ragged edge. It's, it is obviously dangerous. The most vulnerable, vulnerable part is, our, is our, our head, the helmet. You know, some drivers, we've had two drivers pass away in the last couple of years, one in IndyCar, one in Formula One, uh, because that's the one part that's exposed. The rest of our body is very, very safe now. The technology is, is so advanced that it is safe. But of course, we're all conscious of that when we do get in the car. And I, I guess we're all a bit crazy. Uh, to be able to do what we do. And when you, when you finished, when you get out of the car, how do you, how do you come down from that experience? Well, from, from race to race is different in terms of uh, physicality. So there's one race in Malaysia, for example, I lose four, four and a half kilos in an hour and, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. So you're just sweating it out? Yeah, and th I mean, that's, that's horrible. Four kilos lost in that time, you, it's hard to stand sometimes afterwards. But, um, and then in other races, you're, you're, we do have a drinks uh, tube in, in the car, so we generally have like half a litre. So you're trying to sip that through the race to keep yourself hydrated. I mean, a lot of the races I don't drink at all because it's extra weight, and I'm on the limit of the weight right now. So another half a kilo of liquid, I'm like, I can't afford it right now. So um, there's not really much to me to be able to lose, and so I don't know really where I'm going to lose it. But, um, but, then but generally you... afterwards, you just, I switch off. You just switch in and out. I don't know really... You have a big come down at the end of the day. You that's must for sure. do. I mean, that, um, what is that like? You just hit a wall and you pass out. <laughs> um, I mean, it's so, so focused. It's mm. throughout the weekend. Like, for example, I, I'm at Monaco already starts tomorrow for me. So when I get back to Monaco tonight, tomorrow morning, I mean, tomorrow is our usual Thursday and it's media, it's engineering. Uh, yesterday I was at the factory. So we, we had just 
board meetings where we talk about where we were last year, what we've done in the last race, set up uh, the challenges of the track, all these different things that are coming up this weekend, and you just hope that you start on the right foot. Monaco is about one step at a time building up because one little mess up, it really knocks your confidence back and it's really hard to get back there. So it's about just taking baby steps um, and building a real foundation of confidence and keep growing it. You say Monaco is faster. What, two seconds faster? Uh, well, basically, this, uh, we are in the last year of this era of car. So they basically they design a car and then it lasts for three, four, five years and then they build a new, they come up with new regs. So next year we have new rules. Um, but this is, so this is an evolution of the car from three years ago, from 2014. And so, and it's just get, it just gets faster and faster as we continue to add performance. So last year, I think we did a 1 minute 15 or 1 minute 14, 9 there. This year, we'll probably be in the 1 minute 13s um, because also the tires are softer this year, so. Wow. And I, I mean, it's, I was watching on, on board of the, the track last, uh, yesterday, and I was like, have you got it on fast forward? Because it was just so fast how quick we go through Monaco. It's, it's actually, I was watching it, and it's kind of scary watching it, <laughs> thinking <laughs> that I'm going to be doing that this oh weekend. <laughs> It's, it's actually petrifying when you get on the... I mean, I'm crazy, so I don't really get scared, but uh, it, I know I'm going in onto the track this weekend, and by the time you've got to full throttle, these things are just... They're still, it's, it's, literally, I'm controlling it. I'm sitting on a rocket. I've got a big fuel tank of 100 kilos behind me, a big battery Urus pack, which it could, you know, any time that exploded, you're done. Um, fortunately, it's very safe, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just mind-blowing how quick we go through these corners. And you can't see around the corners. So you arrive at the top of Casino at 190 miles an hour. And you're picking out all these. And it's crazy how the mind works because you're, you're pulling all this information in. You can't see what's around the corner, but hoping that where you've turned has been the right point so you don't hit the barrier or, or go wide. So We'll all be hoping this weekend. My, my goodness. And do you ever... I mean, also the, you know, you've got the racing season, then you have your, 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 your time out. I mean, do you ever come back and think, you know, just momentarily, can I do this? Well, I never feel that. No, but you know uh, what I mean? Just, just kind of, no, am, I, sure. I, am I still at the same, you know? Yeah, for, I mean, I think this is probably the first year that I've ever really felt that. We had a longer break, so usually and season ends in um, end of November. And, um, and then you kind of have a bit, you know, you have a PR stuff for another couple of weeks, and then you have your, your couple of week winter break, and then you start training already for the next season. Like, next season, the car's going to be too three seconds faster, so the phys physically it's going to be harder next year. So I've got to prepare for that through the winter. But this year I got back in the car and I was, you know, yeah, you don't know. You, you kind of, have I still got it? You know, have I still got that reaction time? Have I still got the, you know, my goal was always to emulate Edson Senna and win three world championships, and I've done that. So what's the next step? Where else do I want to go with it? And it just so where so else happens, do you want to go? Yeah. I just happen to be the most competitive person I know. So... <laughs> Any time I get in any competition, I just want to win, and, and that's where really I am right now. And what about Lewis Hamilton when he's not racing? Because you've got a, a, a big hinterland of, of interest that you like that perhaps people aren't so aware of. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I generally, I, I remember when I was younger, very narrow-minded about things I wanted to do. I was very narrow-minded man, minded about racing, obviously. And, um, but music's always been a passion. I mean, there's lots of different things that I like. I'm trying to dibble and dabble in everything that I possibly can to see what I do and don't like. Um, most racing drivers, I've, I've calculated that I've got probably seven years left, six, seven years. So I've got three years starting this year with Mercedes, of whom I've been with since I was 13. So it's a great long partnership with this family of, of, who have taken me in and, and, and really supported me for so long. So it's quite a, a unique experience there. And, uh, but yeah, most drivers, they stop and become commentators or or managers, and I really, and I've always thought, I really would not like, don't want to do that. I mean, it's not that it's not a good job or anything, it's just not for it's me. Not for so right now is really about building, firstly, understanding and finding out what I want to do beyond. Building the brand, building the foundation now, so that when I stop, I have something to move on to. So that's really what I'm in discovery right now. Um, but you know, this is, I'm very, there's, there's so many kids that I'm meeting now. I remember, I remember when I was 11, I went to my first Grand Prix and I saw David Coulthard come by and, and just thinking one day, I want to do what you do. Um, you know, and now I'm meeting kids that are in the same position I was in. So I'm really, it, it, it is really a platform for me to inspire young kids doing what I do. 
I don't know how it sometimes it surprises people because I meet people and they're like, you know, this got your win last weekend or your you know your season got me through this experience that I went through. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I definitely want to do something with kids. I love kids, and kids are the future. So that's what are probably going to be my part of my focus. Well, I could talk to you for a very long time. Um, there's so many things I want to ask you, not least about you know possibly that crash with Rosberg and all sorts of things, but. Um, <laughs> We've run out of time, just you and me, but we've got time for questions from you on the floor now. Cool. So, if any, yes, there's a hand back there. We'll get a microphone to you. Thank you so much for such a fascinating and insightful conversation. I've got to ask, as we're at a Google event, what do you make of driverless cars? And might we see a driverless <laughs> F1? Hopefully not within seven years. But what are your thoughts on that? In terms of uh, yeah, taking that bend in Monaco. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I love technology. I've seen, I think Mercedes have done a driverless car. Um, I personally, I mean, when I'm particularly here in the UK, I don't drive a lot on the road. Um, but yeah, this, I don't know if I it can. It's so it. boring. I'm not surprised. I don't know. Um, I think in some ways it's going to be great for people, particularly if you want privacy and you want to make business call, do business while you're on the road. Um, I like to be in control most of the time. I'm actually a very good uh, passenger, so I sleep a lot of the time. Um, I don't like to dr drive long distances, so I think it'll be kind of neat, but I'm most likely not going to be having one of those, <laughs> one of those cars. That. And I, I absolutely hope that it's not in my period of time. I mean, they've, they've brought out, for example, Formula E. I'm very much old school. I love you know, the engines. I love the, the smell of the fuel, the oil, the rubber, everything burning. And, the electric cars don't have, you know, just it's like a shh, shh, coming past. So I want the big sound. We don't have the sound anymore. Um, unfortunately, it's not great, but it's better than nothing. Yes, there's a question here. Thanks. Um, how does it work in the team? I mean, you have, you're competing with your teammate, but it's one team. So how do, how do you get the synergies between both groups? When you have the board meetings, it, is it board meeting together, or are there two board meetings? How does all that work? It's a good question. It's, it's very difficult for sure because um, it is a team, and there's, but there's two championships. There's the constructors, which obviously the team is most focused on and care about most. And individually as drivers, we want to win. We want to be at the front. We want to be the one that wins, uh, that's ahead of the other. So it's a, it, striking a balance of, of your own drive to want to succeed and win the championship, but also doing what your, your duty is, is to bag the points for the team. Um, and particularly when, you know, naturally when the car next to you is exactly the same, all data is shared, finding the, you know, improving, it's really, really hard. You arrive on the weekend and you go out, do a good time, then the guy sees your lap, then he'll go out and do, try and do the same, might beat it, and if he does, then you've got to go. And, so you're just constantly moving forwards. When we have the board meetings, generally we have them together. Um, but for example, yesterday I was, I'm with my, my engineers because we are, uh, both sides of the garage are kind of a unit and we're not discussing what Nico's doing. We've, we're, we're, we're focusing on what we've got to do to be able to win it. And Nico will be over there conspiring to do whatever he's got to do <laughs> to, to win. Um, what it comes down to is management and we've got really great bosses who are very approachable from everyone. And, and in terms of the size of the garage, we try and mix as much as possible. I mean, the garage people do move around a little bit, but um, you know, when I walk into the garage, I go and spend time with Nico's guys and vice versa. And um, we do big team dinners, so it's important to keep that synergy between us all. And as for me and Nico, we just try our hardest to not let our, com you know, we've been racing since we were 13, me and Nico, so we've had that for a long, long time, and um, I think that will be there for, you know, that competitiveness streak that we have together will be there until we retire, and probably even when we're 50, 60 years old, <laughs> he'll still be trying to beat me at something, so, um, you know, that's how it is. Yes, question right at the back there. Thank you. Um, I would like to bring you back to your first uh, World Championship, which is, uh, for every driver, probably the most important one, because it's sort of a break the ice psychologically. And uh, I recall it very well, because I was at the Grand Prix in, uh, in Brazil. In it was such a roller coaster of emotions, which uh, 
I'd like to, 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 to leave it from your point of view. And how was that roller coaster ride for you? Uh, yeah, well, it was terrible. It was a nightmare. It was honestly, um, of course, wanting to be in Formula One, got there on the scene. When you're building up to Formula One, you're, you're obviously preparing to race, but you're not prepared for what comes along with being a Formula One driver. Um, the pressure of such a big team, sponsors, um, media, sitting in front of, sit, you know, sitting on stage talking. You're not prepared for that. You're not put through a school or through other interviews for it. So you arrive in the deep end without being able to swim. And I mean, I made a lot of mistakes. I got into, obviously I was quick on track. That was no, that was the easy part. It was everything outside. But um, lost the first year in 2007 by one point, which was, was you know, depending on how serious you take your job, it was emotionally traumatizing the first year. Came back the next year somehow, came through that, uh, that experience. And then in that last race, I, I had to finish fifth. I started third, I think it was. And that was fourth, fifth. And then with probably like six laps, seven laps to go or something, I was down in sixth. And the guy that was ahead of me was Sebastian Vettel. And there was, if, you know, if, if, it, if I had to do, if uh, I couldn't do anything to, even to save my mother's life. If my mom was over there on the edge of the cliff, I had to pass him to, in order to, I couldn't get past him. <laughs> um, you know, I couldn't get past this guy. And for those laps, I was just wasn't giving up, but I could see that dream fading away. And, um, and then the last lap, some guy was on slick tires. I was on wets. He was stumbling. There's quite a few of them were stumbling. I was overtaking cars here and there. I, didn't, I had no idea where I was. I, I thought they were back markers. The guy came across the line and thought he, for a second, had, was world champion. And then I came across the line 17 seconds later. And I, I crossed the line, and I thought I lost the world championship. So my heart sunk. I, I, I mean, it was, I was distraught. And then... Like, I don't know why they took so long, but like 12, 13 seconds later, they told me I was world champion. And uh, I mean, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I think just at the time, after that big whirlwind of media, back at the factory, there was so much tension. I think I wasn't, I guess I was just, I was only 23. So I, I just don't feel I was, don't forget, you know, growing up, I, instead of hanging out with friends on the weekends and, uh, you know, doing normal kids' social life stuff, I was racing. I was with adults. So I, I missed that a lot, my, that maturity growing up stage. And I, I don't feel I was mature enough to really be able to embrace the whole experience and enjoy it. So I tell you, it was not a great, it, whilst it's amazing that I won the championship, it just wasn't, wasn't able to enjoy it and um, rolled into the second year, the year after that, for example. But the last two championships have really, I guess, of coming of an age, been able to really absorb it and enjoy the moment because so much work has gone in for my family so, you know, I don't take it for granted, the, the opportunity that I have, for one. Um, there are so many people that would cut their leg off to be in my, in my seat and, and do what I do. So I make sure that I just I maximize every time I get in the car. I'm representing my family every time I get in that car. And uh, so there's nothing, uh, there, there's, there's no time for second place. Um, of course, those experiences when you have those lows like the world, uh, losing the world championship only make you stronger when you do or, or realize the, the you know these heights and lows see once you've had the low you appreciate the highs even more so and so presumably particularly frustrating for you this this season i mean it's early days yeah but it's a killer it season gonna... it's it's terrible <laughs> um obviously i had a couple of amazing years the last two uh i would say this is you know luckily through the experience of the 10 years of racing you kind of you, you know, you have the ups and downs, and I definitely think these past five races have been uh, massively testing for myself, for my mechanics, for my engineers. I think each time I see it as a challenge to rise. I see it as a challenge to, you know, I'm going to be facing the media right now, but I feel terrible. I'm angry that I lost the race or something like that. But it's a moment for me to, the kids that are watching, to, to me to say the right things. It's a moment for me to lift my guys up who are probably feeling just as much as me or, or you know, back at the factory who work nonstop to build my car. Mm -hmm. So there's so much going on and I feel like sometimes, I feel often when I do myself, when I do it right, I feel so much, I come out of it so much stronger. And so I do feel this is just a, you know, trials and tribulations. This is a, a period of time of growth for me that 
whilst there's always growth, no matter, you know, I met Nelson De Mandela once um, in, uh, when he was 90, for his 90th birthday, and he said to me that he was still learning at that time, so I wow. have a long way to go, so hopefully. We can take one final question. There's, yes, just in the middle there. <clears throat> Louise, you are, you are extremely exposed to, to stress, media, yeah, competitors, uh, teams, and everything. How do you prepare yourself uh, with, with, to, to, to be so focused, to handle of all, all, all this, this massive stress? Really, it's, um, it's trying to just remain focused on the job at hand and then the task. My goal this weekend is to win this race. All the other stuff is all just noise. And it's just, I guess it's just through experience kind of being able to silence all that and, and stay focused on what's the most important thing. So not be distracted by all the media, all the cameras. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, tomorrow there's so many interviews, mostly with the same people that we always have. So I've been talking to these guys for 10 years. But, and they're often asking the same question that they asked me two weeks ago. But um, obviously they have something more to talk about this weekend because the last race was terrible. But um, I think it really is just trying to, I guess, compartmentalize really uh, that, that stuff put over here, put it in a box, and then f you know, keep the energy and your focus on the one thing that matters most. All that other stuff does not matter. What matters is me and this team, how we're going to get from you know, from Friday or, you know, Thursday this week, for example, to Sunday, standing on top of that podium. And, you know, it's sleep, it's what I eat, it's um, what I spend my time doing, making sure I get to bed early, all these different things that add, add up to it. And sometimes you do it all perfect and it doesn't go well, but that's life. And you just hope that in doing all the right things, um, but it's also trying to find a balance, you know, you need to enjoy life as well, you know. At some stage, I'm going to my career will be over, and I want to look back and say I did, I enjoyed absolutely everything. Every moment in the car, every, every moment out of it. I'm afraid, much as I wish we could carry on, we have to end it there. Um, will you join me in thanking the hugely impressive and very charming Lewis Hamilton?